Like many boys his age, Paul Blazer sold magazine subscriptions to earn extra money. His best sellers were the Saturday Evening Post and Ladies Home Journal, owned by Curtis Publishing Company. Unlike most teenage boys, he hired a full-time adult secretary to manage his growing business. He was an excellent student. Math and trigonometry came easy for Paul, and he would read the textbooks as though they were exciting novels. He was very athletic. As a high school senior, he high jumped five feet, three and a half inches. At the time, jumpers made the U.S. Olympic team by going just three inches higher. He finished high school at age 16, attended William and Vashti College, and made his magazine business even more successful. As a college student, he wrote Curtis Publishing a letter outlining his ideas for improving their sales efforts. They invited him to Philadelphia and offered him a job as head of their school subscriptions all over the United States. Soon he was making over $10,000 a year, which adjusted for inflation was well over $260,000 a year. He was 19 years old. This is just the beginning of the story. Paul G. Blazer went on to be the chairman of Ashland Oil and Refining Company and a true industrial legend. To understand Paul Blazer and the uniqueness of his life, you need to know about his parents and about the values they passed along to him. You need to know the things that influenced him as a young man. And since he left behind an extensive archive of his speeches, letters, and other documents, we can hear much of his story, narrated in his own words. I was born into a family of school teachers in 1890 in the Mississippi River town of New Boston, Illinois. The town had been surveyed and planted in 1834 by Abraham Lincoln. The year I was born, the population was 445, but ten years later there were over 700 residents. The town was small, but it had its own fish market, a soda fountain, and even a button factory. My grandparents were German immigrants, and the family greatly valued responsibility and attention to duty. My father's childhood home was Station Number 3 on the Underground Railroad that began in Quincy, Illinois. The home was described as being on the avenue to freedom in Canada to runaway slaves from Missouri and Kentucky. In the Deep South, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 made capturing escaped slaves a lucrative business, and there were few hiding places for them. Fugitive slaves were typically on their own until they got to certain points farther north. The Underground Railroad didn't involve trains, but was a network of people, African American as well as white, offering shelter and aid to escaped slaves from the South. People known as conductors guided the fugitive slaves. Hiding places included private homes, churches, and schoolhouses. These were called stations, safe houses, and depots. The people operating them were called station masters. The exact dates of its existence are not known, but this network operated from the late 18th century to the Civil War, at which point its efforts continued to undermine the Confederacy in a less secretive fashion. As a youngster, my father David M. Blazer watched as hundreds of slaves passed through the home of my grandmother Blazer. Yes, she was a station master. The stories that my family told of those days and their involvement in assisting the slaves forged my attitudes on race from an early age. When my father was 38, he left the teaching profession as a school principal and used his life savings to become a partner in a small community newspaper, the Alito 
Illinois Times record, 14 miles away. I was born that same year, so I literally grew up around the newspaper business, and I got extensive experience in selling and creating advertisements, which proved very valuable in my future jobs. By 1912, Paul had been working for Curtis Publishing Company for nearly three years, even though he was just 21. While in Philadelphia, Paul became very active in former President Teddy Roosevelt's campaign for president. In 1900, Teddy Roosevelt had been elected vice president on the ticket with President William McKinley. Six months after their inauguration, McKinley was assassinated and T.R. became a very popular president. In 1904, Roosevelt was re-elected and he successfully groomed his close friend, William Howard Taft, who won the 1908 presidential election to succeed him. However, Roosevelt became frustrated with Taft's brand of conservatism. And in 1912, Roosevelt sought to become the Republican Party's nominee for president once again. And on April 10, 1912, when Roosevelt's whistle-stop train tour was in Philadelphia, young Paul Blazer, barely old enough to vote, ended up on the platform with Teddy Roosevelt himself. Roosevelt overwhelmingly won the Pennsylvania delegates with his campaign theme of improved treatment of employees by their corporate owners. But he lost the nomination at the June 1912 Republican National Convention in Chicago to Taft. When Teddy failed to get his party's nomination, he became a third-party candidate of the progressive Bull Moose Party. Once again, Paul Blazer was active in the Roosevelt campaign. Though Roosevelt lost the election, his campaign message of how workers should be treated remained with Paul for the rest of his life. I had no way of knowing it at the time, but my early life themes of a river town, racial advancement, Academic education, physical education, politics, and business would stay central to my life story. In 1914, I returned to Illinois and enrolled at the University of Chicago on a Curtis Publishing Scholarship, earning an associate's degree in philosophy. I was a student coordinator for the intramural sports program and an officer for our yearbook, the cap and gown. And since I was still in the magazine subscription business, I placed an ad in the yearbook. It pulled very well. Paul began courting fellow student Georgia Monroe in 1915. In the spring of 1917, with the war raging in Europe, he planned to enlist in the Army. Like thousands of American couples, Paul and Georgia rushed to the altar before the men started marching off to war. Paul, however, failed his army physical. Football games and several motorcycle episodes had left him with an injured back. He enlisted in the 123rd U.S. Army Hospital Unit, expecting to be shipped overseas. But fate intervened. While he was still in training, his back gave out completely, and he was rushed to the hospital. He spent the next two months in traction. He would never completely recover. For the rest of his life, he wore a back brace to lessen his pain, and he was consistently described as having a stiff, forward-leaning gait. He worked for a short time for Chittenden Press in Chicago before going to the Great Northern Refining Company as advertising manager. He quickly moved into the sales department and in 1918 became sales manager. In 1920, Paul went to work as vice president of the Great Southern Oil and Refining Company in Lexington, Kentucky. And during the extended absences of the company's president, he acquired his first experience in refinery management. His career in petroleum was well underway. By the 1890s, coal was a major industry in eastern Kentucky and coal fields covered 10,500 square miles in parts of 37 counties. Since there can be a close relationship between the presence of coal and the presence of crude oil, it was no surprise when oil was discovered in Floyd County, Kentucky in 1892. 
By 1920, there were active oil wells in 25 counties in eastern Kentucky. The kerosene lamp, invented in 1854, ultimately created the first large-scale demand for petroleum. But the oil world would soon take on vast new importance when the first production Model T Ford rolled off the assembly line in Detroit on October 1, 1908. By 1920, there were 8 million cars registered in the United States. The gasoline industry was on its way to becoming a very large segment of the American economy. Swiss Oil Corporation was founded in Lexington, Kentucky in June of 1918. In 1920, the oil industry was in turmoil as an oversupply of product had caused the price to drop from $4.50 to $1 per barrel in just a few months. In 1923, the company lost over $259,000. That was $3.9 million in 2019 dollars. At this time, Swiss Oil Company was, quote, all but dead, according to the 1960 biography, Blazer and Ashland Oil. Nonetheless, the Swiss Oil owners were impressed by Paul and promised him that they would buy or build a refinery of Blazer's choice for the young man to run. His first choice was a refinery in Latonia, Kentucky, but the owner decided not to sell. Blazer then settled on a refining operation located on the banks of the Big Sandy River at the train stop known as Leach near Catlettsburg, not far from Ashland. The purchase price was $212,000 with $50,000 in cash and the balance in five equal payments. For one thing, it developed in, a very, in, a, in an area which no one considers uh, a particularly good climate to develop a company. Uh, on the edge of Appalachia, in Kentucky. Now, uh, and it started out, uh, started out in trouble. It started out owing more money than it was earning and uh, with personality problems and so forth. Then they hired a very bright young guy, 34 years old. And they didn't know it, and I doubt very much if he knew it, but they hired a genius. At the beginning of the 20th century, automobiles were a novelty that could be enjoyed only by the very rich. Most Americans contented themselves with either using the horse and buggy or taking the railroads when they needed to go on long trips. In 1924, there were no numbered state highways in the United States. Most city-to-city -city roads were still remnants of horse and wagon paths. In 1924, the U.S. Bureau of Public Roads began to investigate the possibility of creating a system of standardized numbered highways. The 1918 roadmap from the Southern California Automobile Club didn't even show any road between Lexington and Ashland. That would mean that there were no roads suitable for highway travelers. A look at the 1930 Kentucky roadmap would show why. The 120 miles between the two cities still had large stretches of gravel roads. When Paul got to Ashland, he found a rapidly growing modern city. Ashland was in the middle of a boom in which the city's population doubled from about 15,000 to nearly 30,000 between 1920 and 1930. There was a brand new 11-story skyscraper, the Ashland National Bank Building, on the corner of 16th and Winchester. And before long, Ashland Refining Company established offices on the seventh floor. Trolleys ran frequently, and there was an abundance of restaurants within a few blocks of Blazer's office. But even as Paul moved into his new office in Ashland, he was still unaware that Swiss oil was in dire financial straits. The refinery purchased by Ashland Refining Company was approximately six miles up the Big Sandy River from its confluence with Catlettsburg. This location had several positives. 
It was on the Chesapeake and Ohio rail line. It had easy access to the Ohio River for barge transportation, and it was near a common carrier oil pipeline, which could be used for cheap transportation from the many eastern Kentucky oil wells to the refinery. In addition, the Ashland area was booming in 1924, and there was a ready supply of skilled labor. During these early years, Ashland sold most of its gasoline in the wholesale market, often to large companies such as Standard Oil of Ohio. And most important, under Paul's management, the company began to become profitable, and it began to grow. In 1926, Paul made some technical improvements in the refinery and began producing a more powerful gasoline, sold under the name Pepper, in a number of gasoline stations that had been acquired by Swiss Oil. The higher octane gasoline was red and was branded Red Pepper. White Pepper was a lower octane product. A few years later, he added another brand to be called Green Pepper, and Paul urged his engineers to develop a green gasoline. When this proved to be unsuccessful, Paul said, get a dye. When he was told there was no green dye in the industry, he was insistent. Finally, the engineer called Paul with the good news that they now had green gasoline. The solution, mix yellow and blue gasoline. Just like that, green pepper gasoline was born. Pepper brand gasoline was sold well into the 1940s. When Paul and his wife Georgia moved to Ashland, they had chosen a house on Central Parkway, a short five-minute drive to his offices in the new Ashland National Bank building. A few years later, the home next door was bought by another couple in their 30s, Fred Vinson and his wife, Roberta. We have a new next-door neighbor, Fred Vinson, who has just completed five years as a U.S. congressman is one of the brightest people I ever met. He's a native of Louisa, Kentucky, but his wife Roberta was living in Ashland when they married a few years ago. He's just opened a law practice here in the Ashland National Bank building. I think he has a great future. Fred Vinson would go on to much bigger things. In 1945, President Harry S. Truman appointed Vinson as Secretary of the Treasury. Yes, his signature appeared on U.S. paper currency. And in 1946, he was named Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. In January of 1953, he swore in Dwight D. Eisenhower as the 34th President of the United States of America. One afternoon in 1930, I received a telephone call from the owner of the Tri-State Refining Company, which a few years earlier had built a plant across the Big Sandy River inside of our refinery. He told me that the plant had been losing about $1,000 a day and that he would turn it over to us if we could assume and pay off his indebtedness, which he had guaranteed personally. He named an approximate figure of around $300,000, and we close the deal over the telephone. During the summer of 1933, in Franklin Delano Roosevelt's first presidential term, J. Howard Marshall, a young assistant solicitor from Yale Law School, working for Secretary of the Interior Harold X, launched a code of fair competition for the petroleum industry. The oil industry sent representatives, including Paul Blazer, to Washington, D.C. Paul served as chairman of the United States Department of the Interior's Petroleum Code Survey Committee on Small Business Enterprise, referred to as the Blazer Committee. Until 1935, Swiss Oil's home office was in Lexington, while the refining operations were supervised by Blazer from Ashland. Paul kept the Swiss management informed by lengthy letters and reports, but he experienced little interference from his management of the Ashland operation. 
By 1935, Ashland Refining Company's earnings were 10 times that of the parent company. On April 7, 1935, Thomas Combs, president of Swiss Oil, died, and Blazer was elected president and CEO. Swiss Oil's headquarters were then moved to Ashland. In 1936, the Ashland Oil and Refining Company was formed, and Swiss Oil was absorbed into the new corporate structure. As his business grew, Paul recognized that the community needed additional education opportunities beyond high school. He had a big idea. But with a country mired in economic problems, the Ashland School Board had no resources to pursue that idea. In 1936, John Diedrich and I went to Frankfurt and lobbied the state legislature for expansion of Kentucky School Board's taxing authority for municipal colleges. In 1938, the Ashland Independent School Board was the only school board in the state to take advantage of the expansion taxation authority by creating the Ashland Junior College. The additional tax for a local two-year college was approved by Ashland voters and the new college opened in September of 1938 in the remodeled First Methodist Episcopal Church at 15th and Central Avenue. The school board had purchased the church property for $35,000. Dr. Herbert Hazel, who was the head of the Indiana University Department of Physics, was announced as the president of Ashland Junior College. With the depression still affecting the country, 72 Ashlanders applied for the job of janitor at the college. When AJC was unable to obtain federal or state aid for needy students, Paul and Georgia Blazer created the Blazer Educational Fund, which provided loans to students to attend the new junior college. The fund's checkbook, with signed blank checks by Georgia, was kept in the front hall chest of drawers should the funds be needed during a time the Blazers were not available. In its first year, Ashland Junior College had around 130 students and a five-person faculty. But it was a beginning, one that eventually led to becoming a branch of the University of Kentucky less than 20 years later. For its first 14 years, the company had operated with such a small staff that the entire home office was located on the seventh floor of the Second National Bank in Ashland. On January 1, 1938, the offices were relocated to a six-story building we had purchased and reconditioned in the previous year. The original cost of the building was low, and the rents from those portions not used by the company paid the operating costs for the entire building. The Ashland Dry Goods has the first floor, and the other five floors were offices. The layout and furnishing of the offices did not indicate any effort to show the rank of executives through the use of prestige symbols. Little use was made of a formal status system. Both junior and senior executives of the company called each other by first names, except Paul was always called Mr. Blazer. Later that same year, he implemented a program that allowed employees to purchase stock in the company. And in 1947, he launched a profit-sharing plan in which employee dividends were paid to employees in the same way that the board declared dividends on stock. In the days before Pearl Harbor, there was a lot of speculation in Washington on what would happen if the U.S. entered World War II. I made several trips there to discuss petroleum's role in a potential major conflict. Frankly and definitely, there is danger ahead. Danger against which we must prepare. If Great Britain goes down, the Axis powers will control the continents of Europe and Asia and Africa and Australasia and the high sea. It is no exaggeration to say that all of us in the Americas would be living at the point of a gun.
Georgia and I were in Washington when Pearl Harbor was bombed. I'll never forget that Sunday. People were listening on the radio to a professional football game when the announcement came. This broadcast to bring you this important bulletin from the United Press. Flash, Washington. The White House announces Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Stay tuned to WOR for further development, which will be broadcast immediately as received. While Franklin Delano Roosevelt was giving his declaration of war speech before the joint session of the United States Congress in Washington, D.C., I was several blocks away in preparations for war meetings. My wife, Georgia, was a guest in the Congressional Gallery during that speech. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Immediately after the U.S. entered World War II, Blazer spent a large part of his time in Washington, helping to fit independent refining companies into the war program. The Secretary of the Interior appointed him chairman of the Refining Committee of the Petroleum Administration of War. He explained to the board at the time, Due to the disturbing conditions resulting from the war, most oil companies are now being run from Washington. I feel it necessary to be there most of the time. Luckily, the CNO's George Washington has great service from Ashland to Washington, leaving about 9 o'clock at night and getting in Union Station about 6 the next morning. As the United States was now involved in the World War, the use of airplanes became a major weapon, creating a need for aviation-grade gasoline. A major expansion of Ashland's refining capacity resulted from a contract dated May 5, 1942, with the Defense Plant Corporation. With this contract, a new refinery was built on 60 acres of land adjacent to the Leach Refinery. The government owned the plant, and Ashland operated it. The total investment in the plant was $16 million. This plant would produce 100 octane aviation fuel for the duration of the war. On October 9, 1944, Paul wrote a letter to Stuart, his youngest child who was in high school in Rhode Island. Paul obviously was concerned that Stewart would soon have to enter the military. The letter read in part, Stewart, none of us knows exactly what will be in store for you. I'm afraid there's considerable hard fighting ahead for us before both Germany and Japan are defeated. And it means it may be a number of years before boys of your age can return to school. No previous generation of modern times has been faced with such a serious threat to their civilization. Boys who go into military service can never know how long they may be there, nor can they foresee the conditions which may prevail at the time of their release. Thus, I especially want you to enjoy yourself this year in every way consistent with constructive student virtues, both within and outside the classroom. With love, PGB. October 19, 1944, Paul resigned as president of Ashland Oil and was succeeded by Howard Marshall. Blazer became chairman of the board with plans to devote most of his time to post-war strategies. The company was now 20 years old and was one of the largest independent oil companies in the Midwest. It had started with 30 employees and now employed over 1,500. Blazer was a young man, just 54, but he had a larger vision, and by turning over the day-to-day -day responsibilities to Marshall, he became free to pursue that vision.
Battleship Missouri, 53,000-ton flagship of Admiral Halsey's Third Fleet, becomes the scene of an unforgettable ceremony marking the complete and formal surrender of Japan. Soon after the war was over, Paul was gifted a phone from Adolf Hitler's bunker by J. Howard Marshall, who had been loaned by Blazer to the Committee on Reparations at the request of Roosevelt. The phone is on display at the Highlands Museum and Discovery Center in Ashland, Kentucky. The war was over and the government did not want to be in the refining business. Their $16 million aviation fuel refinery was government surplus. Blazer negotiated with the federal government for an extended period, in spite of the fact that the government made a concerted effort to attract other bidders, Ashland's offer was the only one made. Ashland purchased the refinery for $2.1 million. The plant became known as the number two refinery. Beginning in 1947, with impending increased refining capacity, sales campaigns emphasized the name Ashland. Blazer had the foresight to have hired an advertising manager in 1944 with a long-term vision of building a gasoline brand for the company. By August of 1948, the company had successfully introduced the new brand Ashland and began to expand its marketing territory. Founded in 1866, Valvoline was one of the early companies created after oil was discovered in Pennsylvania. Its original use was as a lubricant for steam engines running at high temperatures. When the automobile industry mushroomed, Valvoline was a top brand for car lubricants. The 1949 acquisition of Valvoline was a good example of Blazer's focus and determination. On a Thursday afternoon in November, Paul had a long telephone conversation about the possibility of Ashland buying Valvoline. Paul, accompanied by his controller, visited Pittsburgh on Saturday. The parties reached agreement on the deal on Tuesday. The total time of negotiations was less than five days. A new TV station, WSAZ-TV of nearby Huntington, West Virginia, went on the air in 1949, originally broadcasting on Channel 5. The timing was right for Ashland Oil, as they were now marketing the Ashland brand of gas and had just acquired Valvoline. The Saturday Night Jamboree was a live, locally produced program that was a big hit on WSAZ, and Ashland Oil became a longtime sponsor of the program. There was only one local channel on TV then, and if you wanted to watch TV Saturday night at 7 o'clock, this is what you saw. Ashland Oil and Refining Company, refiners of A-plus gasoline, so good it's guaranteed more powerful for your money back. The program was so successful that Ashland Oil print ads featured the show's star, Dean Sturm, and the dancers Harry Mills and the Haylofters. The most concentrated rapid growth period of the company was 1948 to 1950, when assets grew from $24 million to $104 million. The four big acquisitions were Allied Oil, Cleveland, Aetna Oil, Louisville, Freedom Valvoline, Freedom, Pennsylvania, and Frontier Oil, Buffalo. Now, growth, as such, was not an objective, but because petroleum is an expanding industry, our growth is almost unavoidable. The series of mergers in 1948 to 1950 not only quadrupled the value of Ashland's assets, but broadened its marketing territory to a circle extending roughly 200 miles from Ashland to include all of the Ohio Valley, and a substantial part of the Great Lakes area. The Ohio River remained the key to Ashland's transportation system, and towboats with oil barges now extended their trips upstream to Freedom 
and downstream to the Mississippi, which they plied from Illinois to Louisiana. In 1950, the company had grown so rapidly that we needed more space. There was an old two-story house on the corner of 14th and Winchester, next to our six-story corporate headquarters. We built a seven-story building on the site and more than doubled our office space in the process. Jesse Stewart was born and raised in nearby Greenup County, Kentucky. At the age of 28, his first book, Man with a Bull-Tongued Plow, received international acclaim. In 1943, his book Taps for Private Tussie was a book of the month selection, and from there, his literary credentials began to bloom. Stewart published over 460 short stories. In the golden age of magazines, when short stories were very popular, Jesse was second only to F. Scott Fitzgerald in the number of works of fiction published. Yet Jesse's success was greatly underappreciated in northeastern Kentucky. Perhaps it was because he could be seen shopping at the AMP in Ashland with his wife Naomi every Friday, and then getting his hair cut at the Henry Clay Hotel barber shop, just like regular people. Paul Blazer recognized Jesse Stewart's genius early on and the two of them both shared a passion for education. One of the results of their friendship was that it became a long-standing tradition for Stewart to open each annual meeting of the company with a story, a poem, or a bit of humor. Paul had always been a proponent of Kentucky State College in Frankfurt the state's only Negro school in an era when segregation was the law. In 1950, he had a conversation with school president, R.B. Atwood, who told Paul, we have so many worthy students who can't even afford tuition here. Just as he had done with Ashland Junior College, Paul immediately wrote a large check, which was the beginning of the Kentucky State College Student Loan Program. Paul was also heavily involved with another traditionally black college, Central State Wilberforce, Ohio. Fighting surges on the front lines in Korea, pivoting on the strategic ridge nicknamed Old Baldy, stripped clean by intensive bombardment over the months. Beginning in 1951, the United States was again at war. This time in Korea. Just as his father had done, young Stuart Blazer volunteered for the service of his country. He was soon commissioned as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army's 7th Infantry Division. In an era when the nightly news was 15 minutes, Paul and Georgia would watch the broadcast on WSAZ-TV hoping to find some good news about what was called the Korean conflict. Good news never came. Stewart was killed in action on October 14, 1952, just two weeks after he landed in Korea. Following Stewart's death, Paul and Georgia established the Stewart Blazer Foundation in memory of their youngest son. After 20 plus years of grants for the Ashland area, the Stewart Blazer Foundation was terminated in 1975. One half of the remaining funds paid for the initial restoration of the Paramount Art Center, and the remaining funds paid for the building and one year's operation of the Ashland Tennis Center before being gifted to the city of Ashland. The Blazer family also funded the Blazer Lecture Series at the University of Kentucky in memory of their son, Stuart. Paul's lifelong interest in sports blended smoothly with the marketing of Ashland Oil's products. 
The company became a statewide radio sponsor of University of Kentucky basketball and football games, as well as other colleges in the state. They even produced a set of cards featuring basketball players. And the next step was sponsoring Cincinnati Reds games on the radio with the legendary announcer, Wade Hoyt. One of Paul's most important accomplishments was little noted by most people. The modernization of the Ohio River locks and dams transformed the Ohio River into a major inland waterway. He lobbied relentlessly to make this happen. And once it happened, his comment was typically modest. I consider myself a marketer and a salesman. We must never forget we live in a world of people rather than a world of things. Others can do more than we can for ourselves. Ashland's racial history is much like other towns that were settled in the early 1800s. When people first migrated to what was then Polk Settlement, some brought their slaves with them. The Colored School, Booker T. Washington, was founded around the turn of the 20th century and J.J. Rogers was principal of the school from 1903 through 1922. And in 1922, Dr. Charles B. Knuckles became the principal, and the first two-year class graduated in 1925. The first four-year class graduated in 1932. When Paul Blazer moved to Ashland in 1924, the Booker T. Washington School had already been around for some time. Dr. Knuckles immediately found a supporter and friend in Paul G. Blazer, and they were united in their desire and their efforts to advance racial equality. In 1953, Fred Vinson, Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, passed away eight months before his court was due to rule on the Brown v. the Board of Education, which ended legal segregation. From my many conversations with Fred, I knew that he would be 100% opposed to separate but equal schools in America. Fortunately, the next year, the Supreme Court made the right decision, and integration became the law of the land. In 1955, Ashland's Junior College, Crab Elementary, Ashland High School, and the Booker T. Washington grade and high school began integrating, beginning with the first grade. The plan was to integrate one year at a time. It was called gradual desegregation. Since Paul had established the student loan fund at Kentucky State College in 1950, he had become more and more involved in the cause of equality in education. In 1960, the Paul G. Blazer Library was dedicated at the college in Frankfort. Kentucky State College became a university in 1972. In 1962, Ashland High and Booker T. Washington closed and Paul G. Blazer High School opened. 3,000 guests from across the state attended the dedication of the school with a pool. In Ashland, the integration process went about as smoothly as was possible. Beginning with the 1962-63 to 63 school year, Ashland's schools were fully integrated, years ahead of the original schedule. In January of 1957, Paul retired from his position of the chairman of the board of directors of Ashland Oil. He had been the chief executive officer of the company since its founding. And at age 66, 
he had built a management team that would take the business to continued success. Now that he no longer had day-to-day -day responsibility, he began spending his days at home on Bath Avenue in Ashland. And now, he turned his attention to activism and to philanthropy. Less than 20 years after the founding of Ashland Junior College, Paul wanted to take local education to a higher level. After a series of meetings with the University of Kentucky, Paul and local attorney Henderson Dysard had a meeting with the UK Board of Trustees in Lexington. Dysard frequently shared this story. As they walked up the steps of the university, he asked Blazer of the probable outcome of the meeting. The answer to the young attorney was, oh Henderson, do not enter such a meeting as this without knowing the outcome beforehand. The outcome was that Ashland Independent School District's Ashland Junior College became the Ashland Center of the University of Kentucky. At the time, the only other UK center in the state had been in Covington. Others soon followed. In 1964, Ashland Center, University of Kentucky, became Ashland Community College. In 1970, a new campus was built on a hill overlooking 13th Street. Today, the Ashland Community and Technical College has three campuses in the region. In late 1957, three schools were being planned for Ashland. Claude Famin, the Ashland Board of Education president, expressed the Ashland School Board's desire to name the new high school after Blazer. Blazer's reply to the 1957 request. Dear Claude, although the thought was quite a shock to me, I felt greatly honored by the expressed desire of the members of the Ashland School Board to name the new high school for me. After discussing the matter with Mrs. Blazer and my children, Paul Jr. and Doris, I'm honored to accept this very great honor. Again, I desire to express my appreciation of the compliment you have implied to our family. Paul G. Blazer Twenty-seven lives were lost when a school bus plunged over a 50-foot cliff and into the Big Sandy River near Prestonsburg, Kentucky. The children were from 8 to 17 years of age. Many of those who died had escaped the bus and drowned. Miraculously, 21 students escaped the wreckage and were able to swim to shore. Such a tragedy. The Prestonsburg, Kentucky bus disaster occurred on February 28, 1958 barely two months after Blazer's acceptance of the Ashland School Board's request to name the new high school after him. This accident profoundly affected Paul. He was saddened that so many of the students escaped the bus but drowned because they couldn't swim. He fervently believed that everyone should know how to swim. With this in mind, Paul contacted Claude Fannin and donated $100,000 to the new school to cover the cost of an indoor pool for all students. In 1939, Governor Happy Chandler appointed my wife, Georgia, as the first woman trustee of the University of Kentucky. She would hold that position from 1939 to 1960. In 1961, the university named a new women's dormitory after her, a tribute to her 21 years of service. Georgia Blazer Hall is just down the street from Memorial Coliseum, where the Adolph Rupp's Kentucky Wildcats play.
Ashland Oil had been one of the first major advertisers when WSAZ-TV went on the air in 1949. You stop at the sign of your Ashland Oil dealer for finest products, finest automotive service in sight. And Paul had watched with interest how programs such as Ding Dong School and Watch Mr. Wizard had been highly effective in childhood learning. Watch Mr. Wizard. Now, Mr. Wizard is not his real name, but that's what all the kids in the neighborhood call him because he shows them the magic and mystery of science in everyday living. The Kentucky Authority for Educational Television was created in 1962 by O. Leonard Press as its executive director. However, the legislature did not fund the network, and a statewide network needed to have 13 transmitter sites all across the state. In 1964, I purchased a fifth grade TV math program titled Patterns in Arithmetic. It was being broadcast on Channel 3, and 3,000 tri-state students were participating. More than 600 students in Ashland schools were enrolled. The series was inaugurated on WSAZ-TV on January 26, 1965. Yet barely eight months later, at the beginning of the new school year in September 1965, the station canceled. A great many schools within range of WSAZ-TV signal had purchased TV equipment just to receive this program. A lot of people were very upset. Paul Blazer meant to do something about it. With the promised support of Governor Breathitt for a statewide TV network, I personally acquired 13 station sites across Kentucky and then gifted the sites to the Commonwealth. State ownership of the site was a necessary step to qualify for and expedite potentially $2 million in federal grants to enable the expansion of educational television beyond Louisville. In Blazer's communications with the governor, he made clear his preference that no publicity be given to his gifts. The governor signed the budget bill funding Kentucky Educational Television on January 14, 1966. The bill contained an annual allocation of $359,000 for KET. That meant that construction would occupy the next two years. Paul got the news of the bill signing at his winter home in Scottsdale, Arizona. Two years after the death of Paul Blazer, the book The Exception was published. The story was about Ashland Oil, but the heart of the book was about its founder. Author Otto Scott reflected on the man behind the legend. He spoke of the early years, when Blazer took over a failing enterprise. And without getting rid of anybody or without changing the ground rules, he made the whole thing come alive. And this person is Paul Blazer. And that was Paul Blazer. Mm -hmm. So by the time he left, he was on the verge of a billion dollars in sales. And finally, Scott spoke of Paul, the man. So he was never lonely, and he was never bored. And while Paul was very modest about his success, the author gave a rare glimpse into Paul's pride. He appreciated, for instance, the effort that I was making to write uh, about that company. When he heard that I was interviewing, he was delighted. He was delighted. 